Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Anu Ojar. I'm one of the directors of the UK's National Space Centre and director of the National Space Academy program. Um, I've got two foci in my presentation this morning. One is on risk in human spaceflight, and, and the other one is to celebrate the work of the National Space Academy program and Lloyd's Register Foundation. But underpinning both of them, of course, are, are the concept of space. The internationally accepted boundary of space is much closer to us than most of us realize. From where we are seated right now, space is only 100 kilometers away. That's 62 miles. The distance to space is less than the distance I've traveled this morning in coming down from Leicester. The problem is, of course, it's 100 kilometers straight up. And if we want to get up there, we've got to battle against gravity, a force that, that's dominated the way life's evolved on this planet for billions of years. And if we want to stay in space, we've got to deal with an environment from a radiation, from a thermal, and from a pressure point of view that's more challenging than anything that we could until recently replicate here on Earth. But once we transcend that boundary, the view, of course, is literally breathtaking. This is footage shot from the International Space Station. So it's the sort of view that Tim Peake had for six months during his, his increment on board. Um, the horizon is more than 1,000 miles away. We're at an altitude of about 250 miles. You can see a wonderful display of the aurora uh, australis and borealis, the interaction of the solar wind with the upper atmosphere as it's funneled by Earth's magnetic field. And of course, it's a living geography lesson when we start to look at human civilization, the distribution, the way it hugs the coastline and moves inland along rivers and so on. And of course, this is the sort of view, I think, that most captures the imagination and most inspires people. But the number of people who've ever had this view is much smaller than you might think. It's only 555 in all of human history. That would fit comfortably into a Boeing or an Airbus A380 super jumbo. And one of the major challenges and reasons for this, of course, is the energetic challenge of getting objects into low Earth orbit. You need to get something from a standstill on a launch pad moving for low Earth orbit with a velocity of five miles every second. And the technology behind this is not that advanced. We are using an old technology in the form of chemical rocketry. On the top right, I've got a representation of the launch vehicles that have been used to launch every human being into space since 1961. Now, there are all sorts of scales, all sorts of sizes. Some of them are solid fuels, some are liquid fuels. But the one thing they all have in common is on this graph in the bottom right, more than 80% of your liftoff mass is propellant. It's fuel and it's oxidizer, and it is used up in the first few minutes. Now, in terms of solid fuels or liquid fuels, they've both got advantages, both got disadvantages. For solid fuels, it's great. They're easy to make. You get a high thrust. You can store them for long periods of time. The problem is, when they have failure modes, those failure modes tend to be catastrophic. And so there's a tendency to look towards liquid fuels. Of course, they're throttleable. You can control the flow. The problem is, for the amount of exothermic energy you must liberate from a chemical reaction, we need enormous masses. And that means for substances like hydrogen and oxygen, we have to liquefy them. We have to reduce their temperature into the cryogenic regime, which has got its own challenges of fuel storage, et cetera. And so although we are using chemical rocketry, and we've been doing so for nearly a century, in fact, for fireworks for several centuries, we still have major challenges that we have to face. Now, the problem with that picture on the top right is you don't get an idea of scale. So what I've done is I've taken probably the most famous launch vehicle of all, the American Saturn V rocket that was used in the lunar program. And a few years ago, when I was less follically challenged than I am now, you can see me here at Johnson Space Center uh, at the business end of a, of a Saturn V rocket. Um, those F1 engines are absolutely enormous. This is one of three vehicles left over at the end of the Apollo program when the final missions were cancelled. And so we're lucky enough to, to be able to see it on display. And herein lies one of the problems. Most rockets are single use. That 80% or 85% mass that is uh, propellant is used up in a few minutes and then the stages either tumble into the Atlantic Ocean or onto the plains of Kazakhstan if they're being launched by the Soviet Union. So in, in the 1970s, the Americans had a bold attempt to try to reduce the cost of access to space and human spaceflight through development of a partially reusable system. And this, of course, was the space shuttle, where you had an airliner-type vehicle, the orbiter, where your crew sat in and your payload was carried into orbit. That returned to Earth with the crew. You had the world's largest fireworks, your solid rocket booster, strapped onto the side. 
that provided 85% of your liftoff thrust, and you had a huge orange liquid fuel tank with liquid hydrogen and oxygen, about 600 tons of it, to power your main engines. It was a concept that promised easy access to space. NASA was getting commercial contracts to launch more and more satellites, but it also fell victim to its own publicity and the pressures on the program, because we know as engineers and scientists, that engineering obeys the laws of physics, not the laws of PR. And NASA learned this, and of market forces, NASA learned this to its cost on the 28th of January, 1986. This, of course, is the launch of Challenger, the 25th mission in the shuttle program. Um, the shuttle promised access to space at the rate of one launch every two weeks. But by 1985, there were nine launches in the year that was pushing NASA to its limits in terms of personnel and in terms of safety issues. As we're ascending upwards, this is the most critical point during launch. We're pun punching through the lower, dense layers of Earth's atmosphere. We're reaching a point now of what we call maximum aerodynamic stress on the vehicle, getting near the speed of sound, six and a half million pounds of thrust, most of it from those solid rocket boosters, and the crew are located just here. Uh, the whole of the United States was watching this launch because on board, of course, was the first teacher in space candidate, Krista McAuliffe. So we're now throttling our main engines on the, on the back of the orbiter itself to 65% of their thrust to try to reduce the aerodynamic stresses on the vehicle. The engines throttle up. We're about 70 seconds after launch now. Everything looks nominal. The engines are about to throttle up again. A wind shear is encountered at 48,000 feet. Up. Three engines now at 104%. Challenger, go and throttle up. Challenger, go and throttle up. Seconds. And we have destruction of the orbiter and the fuel tank 73 seconds after launch with the two solid rocket boosters carrying on on their paths until they are detonated, exploded by the, by the range safety officer. Um, what had happened? We'd had a leakage from the side of one of the solid rocket boosters because of a failure of the O-rings that were sealing the various joints. That in itself caused uh, a fracturing of the support mount, which then swiveled around, ruptured the liquid hydrogen oxygen tank. What you see here is not a thermodynamic explosion. It's the vaporization of hundreds of tons of liquid oxygen and hydrogen. But as far as the orbiter was concerned, whether or not it was thermodynamic w w w was immaterial. Dynamic stresses destroyed the vehicle and, of course, killed the seven crew on board. As you know, there was a, a major uh, uh, inquiry into this, the Rogers Commission, uh, and it determined that this O-ring failure was completely avoidable because NASA had made the decision to launch having a launch temperatures way below what the, the material was actually qualified for. And they still went ahead with the launch because of the commercial pressures, even though engineers had flagged this up as a major safety issue. And this has been covered in several documentaries. I want to draw your attention to Professor Diane Vaughan's comments. She, she talks about the normalization of, of, of deviance. Because although this was operating outside the parameters, many of NASA's hierarchy of engineers had said, well, that may be true, but we have launched in lower temperature conditions than this before. In other words, you have set parameters for safety, but you can get a creeping expansion of those parameters because you accept the fact you've got away with it, and that tends to normalize what you would normally regard as being deviant parameters that, that would inhibit your launch. And I think this is a salient lesson uh, in people for, for people in many other sectors as well. After two years, the shuttle returned to flight, and, and, and we had nearly 100 more missions until, hauntingly, we had an almost repeat of the normalization of deviance, but at a different critical point, which is re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. This is February the 1st, 2003, the 113th shuttle mission, STS-107, 16-day science mission. The challenges of re-entry are that you've got to lose that speed of five miles a second by re-entering Earth's atmosphere. Now, the sort of common parlance would say, as you do, you get frictional heating as you enter at Mach 25 at an altitude of 70 miles. Actually, it's not friction. It's ram air compression of the gases ahead of the vehicle. That, of course, because of the laws of physics and chemistry, will heat up the gases ahead of the vehicle. That's thermally transferred to the structure. Your orbiter doesn't care whether you call it friction or ram air compression. The point is, it will heat up in places to two, two and a half thousand degrees centigrade. You have to have a thermal protection system, otherwise you will not survive your re-entry. The mission was proceeding very well. But even though it was a 16-day mission that seemed incredibly successful, its fate was sealed at launch. Because what you can see here are flecks of material coming off the orange tank, impacting with the underside. You can see them 
hitting the wing. This was noticed by launch engineers. They alerted their hierarchy to the risk that was involved in terms of penetration of that uh, thermal protection system. They were overruled. Because although this was an issue according to the original parameters of the shuttle program, people had got away with far more impact events and the shuttle had been safe. There was a normalization of the deviance again. And so after a tremendously successful mission on the 1st of February 2003, the shuttle on re-entry lost its orientation, was destroyed during re-entry, uh, and the, the remains of the vehicle were scattered across thousands of square kilometers of, of Texas and, and, and Oklahoma. And the reason why this happened is that even a three or four kilogram block of, of low density styrofoam, these are our, our ballistic tests that were done after the accident, hitting the thermal protection system are enough to blast a fatal hole. This is the inside footage. And of course, once that happens, then on re-entry, your high temperature plasma is gonna come in, weaken your structure, your vehicle is doomed. And once again, there was normalization of deviance. And I would say it's something we need to look at in all sectors. To what degree is this true in our sector? There are some lessons we can learn from the, the calamities we've had in, 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 in space flight. Now, there have been other near misses in, in human space flight. I've concentrated on the two mo most well-known ones. Um, <laughs> quoting statistics can be a poison chalice, of course. But in terms of the number of people who've ever gone into space, 555 have gone, 18 have died in the process. From a statistical point of view, human space flight is riskier than even extreme wingsuit proximity base jumping. And although we work to try to improve safety, it will always have that risk because of the energy regimes as well as the environment that we're trying to access. And that's why, of course, safety is such a critical factor. Some images of Tim Peake doing various aspects of his survival training. And of course, when it comes down to his spacewalk, famously, he spent four and a half hours outside the uh, International Space Station. Every single hour of this is rehearsed in these neutral buoyancy tanks for 10 hours beforehand to try to maximize the safety regime. This is the world's largest one currently that's in Texas. Um, we have a bigger facility planned for the United Kingdom. It's called Blue Abyss. It's going to have a 50 meter deep tank. It's going to be twice the volume. But the key thing here is that the lessons learned from spaceflight can be used in many other industries. So in terms of the usage of this facility, it's not just going to be for the space sector. It is aimed at marine engineering, commercial diving operations, etc. There is much that we can learn when it comes down to risk mitigation between industries. Very often people ask me, you know, human spaceflight is the most visible symbol of, of space science. But when people ask, what do you mean by space science? I say there are three categories. This is a very personal sort of definition. There's looking out there. This is traditional astronomy. There's getting out there, which is robotic and human exploration. But then there's a side that people tend to overlook, which Lord Willits referred to earlier. It's the business of having a whole armada of satellites that are looking back at the home planet. This is satellite applications, be it telecommunications satellites, the applications of GPS, monitoring Earth's climate from space with large and small satellites. This is a way that space is benefiting life on Earth and is enabling our 21st century fabric of life to actually be the way that it is. And this is the side of space that is the big revenue generator. The current figures for space revenue generation are exceeding 250 billion US dollars per year. And of course, in the United Kingdom, we are generating more than 13 billion pounds per year through this industry. And that really was the original rationale for the UK's National Space Academy program. You know, inspiring the next generation of scientists and engineers is one of the most quoted cliches that we come across. But of course, there's, there's a whole spectrum going from inspiration to education and skills development. And they're all very, very valuable. Where the National Space Academy sits specifically, it started at secondary school level and it's moved up now into university level. And we work with three audiences, with students directly, because curriculum qualifications in science and engineering are the most valuable currency that they can have. We work with training teachers to be more effective by using space context, and we work directly with industry so that young people can see a viable pathway that we can follow. We started off working just with the space sector, but we've expanded to support science and engineering. And our methodology is very simple. We have a core team based at the National Space Center. We have, in addition, over 30 of the UK's very best science teachers who are still teaching full-time, but seconded to our program for one month a year. We call them lead educators. We have some of the UK's leading space scientists who are working with us, and we use this synergy to develop and deliver all of our programs for students, 
and for teachers. Now, thanks to the Lloyds Register Foundation, we were able to expand our network from 12 lead educators to nearly 30. We were an England-based programme through Lloyds Register Foundation. We've expanded through Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And we're now working with more than 8,000 students a year. And, and the way that we work is very simple. What I've got here is an outline of how our understanding of the planet Mars has changed in my lifetime. Mars is a world that's as different from the Earth as it is, it is, it is, it is alike. And the telescopic view is tantalizing. You see it's got polar caps. You see it's got seasons. You see it's got rotation and a day-night cycle. But that's the limit of resolution. And in the 1960s and 1970s, we got the first successful planetary flybys. We saw a world with tectonic rift valleys, so partial cracks in the crust. We saw giant features like Olympus Mons here, a shield volcano the size of France that's three times taller than Mount Everest. We saw an atmosphere that was dynamic enough to support tornadoes or dust devils, but that pressure is incredibly low. The pressure on Mars at the surface is the same as in Earth's stratosphere at an altitude equivalent to the height that Felix Baumgartner jumped from in 2012. Mars might look Earth-like, but pour liquid water on the surface, it will simultaneously freeze and boil away. This is more like the moon than Earth. But all over the surface, we see tantalizing clues that this wasn't always the case. We see sedimentary rocks, we see enormous river systems the size of whales, and all this tells us that billions of years ago, Mars was much warmer, Mars was much wetter, Mars had a hemispherical ocean. And that means billions of years ago, perhaps it was a place that life started. Why did Mars lose its atmosphere? This is, all of this is a story that absolutely fascinates the general public. But to explain key parts of this story, we can use fundamental themes from the physics and chemistry and engineering and mathematics curriculum. And that's what the National Space Academy does. Uses those contexts to boost curriculum understanding. And we don't just use Mars, we use all of those areas from space science and we go across the science and engineering curriculum. We're working with thousands of students a year. We have set up the UK's first full-time courses pre-university in space engineering, and we've been honored enough to, 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 to be invited to work with, with the China Space Agency and also the new United Arab Emirates Space Agency for their skills development program. But of course, the most, for us, high profile and, 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 and really impactful work that we, we, we got to do recently was in support of Tim Peake's mission. We were asked by UK Space Agency to devise an educational program that would have legacy for many years to come, rather than being an ephemeral one that you look at, you go, wow, but, but, but you quickly forget. Now, of course, you know, to do that, we wanted to make something different. So we wanted to have Tim doing experiments in space that could be replicated by students on the ground in a different way to give different results. We wanted to create some teaching films involving Tim to explain fundamental concepts. We wanted to develop uh, a suite of teacher guides, and UK Space Agency said to us, you go ahead, you build the kit, you flight qualify it, we will fly it for you. Now, sending kit to the International Space Station, you don't just shove it into a rocket and launch it into space. You have to prove that it will not shake itself to pieces in launch. You have to prove that it's when it's on the space station, toxic fumes are not going to come off. You have to flight qualify it fully. You have to write the procedures for Tim so that in the 200 experiments he's doing, he knows exactly what to do. This is my colleague, uh, Andy McMurray, head of teaching and learning. His post was funded by Lloyd's Register Foundation. And he led the flight qualification and the procedures. We would not have been able to do what we have done without Andy's input, and therefore the foundation's input. Some scenes from the vibration test, and we were qualified for what's called a SpaceX launch on, on a Falcon 7. Uh, and plan A was we were stashed away along with Heston Blumenthal's school dinner on top of that capsule, an unmanned vehicle, on the 28th of June 2015. And those of you who are space aficionados will know that two minutes after launch, we had what we call in the sector an anomaly, which is probably the, the biggest understatement of all time. We had a catastrophic failure of, of, of the booster uh, and destruction of our payload. Luckily, we had a backup. We flew that back up, Tim did our experiments, and I'm delighted that the results of all this are being released globally tomorrow. Now, my colleague, Dr. Kieran Shah, is with us. Uh, Kieran, do you want to just put your hand up, waving to everyone? Uh, we're going to give everyone here a sneak preview during the breaks, but I want to show you just one minute of, of, of some of the experiments, and as I say, none of this has gone out publicly yet. So you can see we've got classical experiments that people have done before, showing kinetic theory of gases, circular motion, momentum modeling in different types of collisions. So it's your classic physics and some chemistry modeling that's used. Um, the behavior of uh, diatomic oscillators, of course, for infrared spectroscopy. 
but you'll notice the grid in the background as well. What we then did with the 28 gigabytes of footage that we got is we dynamically analysed everything. So students themselves can start to measure parameters going up to A-level and going up to first year university standard. We had cameras that were filming in X, Y and Z planes. We video captured this, but students also have the software to do their own analysis. And what we're hoping, of course, is that this will have a programme with impact internationally for, for, for a generation of physics and engineering students and their teachers. So in conclusion, I'd, I'd like to thank you for your patience, but I have one final point that I want to finish on. You know, in terms of human spaceflight, risk will always be there, but most of our human spaceflight experience has been in, in low Earth orbit, a few hundred kilometers of the Earth. There were 24 human beings, though, 40 years ago, went on a far more audacious voyage. Um, the International Space Station orbits here, hugging the Earth. Going to the moon is a journey a thousand times further. And between 1968 and 1972, 24 human beings became the only members of our species to explore an alien world, because that's what the moon is on our doorstep. Probably the most audacious voyages of exploration our, you know, humans have ever gone on. And I want to finish with a quote from one of them. It's the commander of the Apollo 15 mission, Dave Scott, in this wonderful landing site, the Hadley Apennine Valley in, 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 in July 1971. These were his first words as he stepped out on the lunar surface. As I stand here today, I am reminded of a fundamental truth. Humanity must explore, and this is exploration at its greatest. Now, for a long time, I thought he meant space exploration, but I now think he meant the voyage of exploration that humans have been able to go on because of the application and the understanding of science and technology and mathematics. It's not just about the next generation of people going into STEM, it's about having a future workforce that is literate in the language of science and engineering and mathematics. They are the drivers of technological progress, and if we don't keep that journey going onwards, then we are in danger of stultifying as a species. That's why we feel our work, working in education and skills development, is such a privilege. It's also why it has been such a privilege for us to be able to present to all of you today about our work. So to the Lloyds Register Foundation, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Is there a time for one or two questions? So. Hi. Uh, Tim Slingsby from the uh, Lloyd's Register Foundation. Really, really enjoyed that presentation. Very compelling. Uh, but I'm obviously really interested in the, in the resources that we'll find out much more about in the breaks and tomorrow. But you say they're going to be released globally. I wonder what work you did to test the international ability, for want of a better word, of these resources in terms of different cultures and different curriculums. It's an interesting one. I think, um, Lord Willits, if you're with us, I, I think you'll be interested in this as well. Um, I, I did a sneak preview of this. We're, we're, we're doing a lot of work with China with some of the, the, the leading master teachers in China uh, through the UK-China Space Science Collaboration that we lead the skills and training for. So I was out this summer with, with, with 50 students that have been selected from all over China, many of them from rural areas, very, very bright, not much financial support to them, two-week training camp at, uh, held in Beijing. And so I just, just field tested some of these and the, teach, the students and teachers were absolutely blown away. Uh, I remember there were, there were three students who started doing analysis with, 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 with the, uh, the tracker software that we've included. And the staff from the British Embassy with us were convinced they were university students. And they're actually, they're, they, are, they are applying to international universities this year, trying to get scholarships and so on. So certainly we know, you know at, at the end of the day, we like to think that science and engineering the, the subject transcends sort of national boundaries. Um, of course, there are, are cultural variations, there are, are, are scholastic variations, but what we found with the field testing we've done in a very limited way is there is an international scope. And one thing we are doing is that we are, we are, we are, we are releasing this as, as open access. We have been approached already and invited to get our remaining flight set spare of kit uh, potentially flight qualified to fly on the new Chinese space station as part of a collaboration with the China National Space Administration. And that was at their bequest, having seen, at their request, having seen uh, a sneak preview of what we're doing. So I'd like to think that we will be able to do more of this work. That kit's still on board the International Space Station originally. Um, and, and so I think we can do it better because, you know, it was about risk taking. Nobody had ever used this tracker software filming from three directions. We didn't know if it was going to work as effectively as it, as it did, but we can make it better. So it's about taking those risks in your methodology. 
Sorry, that was an essay answer to your, to your question, Tim. Uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, again, we have one at the front from Ruth. Thank you, thank you. I know it's amazing. And um, one of the things that um, in my job as doing research at the Lloyd's Register Foundation, I'm looking at the, the transfer of knowledge from the space sector for safety into other sectors, into the offshore, and you talked about that big tank. I'm wondering if you have a, a program of work, you know, or, or if you can give us insights into how the translation of safety understanding is moving from the space sector into other sectors. It, it's interesting because there are people in the space sector, specifically in space engineering, and they are right in saying that we are dealing with an environment that is orders of magnitude more challenging than anything else would experience. You need to qualify hardware for spaceflight to withstand a radiation environment where doses are going to be far higher, where it may be 15 years before it even gets reserviced or never reserviced at all, one use only, surviving your rigors for launch, etc. But you also get, I think, as challenging environments and parameters in, in, say, the aerospace sector. If you think about the mechanical stresses that, that one, you know, one Trent turbine blade undergoes, and yet we are expecting that as a critical component to function 14, 15 hours per day in a life cycle of an airliner for average duties for, for, for many years, and the mechanical stresses. There are differences, but I think there are some common themes that can cross-fertilize. Now, whether that's being done yet or not, I don't know. With the Blue Abyss program, I said, you know, this is a facility that could be used for marine engineering and so on and, and autonomous vehicle testing. There are safety issues that are generally common, but perhaps this is an area that the foundation could lead upon because I'm not a risk expert, uh, so I'm, I'd be happy to be correct on this, but I'm not aware of large scale studies that have identified key areas from one industry that can easily translate to another. If they are there, I'd be very interested to read them, um, but if they're not, then perhaps that's an area that Lloyd's bringing together a number of different sectors could, could, work, could help to catalyze. Hi there, um, I'm Tiger Owen from the Schumacher Institute. Um, it's really interesting what you started in the presentation with, uh, with Challenger uh, disaster. Um, as a psychologist and human factor specialist myself, this is, I find it incredibly chilling whenever we see the, the, these kinds of things. Um, I wonder if, uh, in light of the forthcoming strand on human and social factors, you can make some comments about perhaps the interest from, from your side uh, on, on, the, um, on the potential that uh, that um, activity could offer. Human factors, I mean, certainly it, it, it's a major issue when it comes down to long duration missions in space. If we are to, if we are to go to Mars, uh, um, Elon Musk notwithstanding, if we are to go to Mars, we're talking of a mission duration of, of probably two to two and a half years with home and transfer orbits and so on. Um, so the, the issues of isolation and human behavior become absolutely critical. We know from long scale simulations on the ground, 520 days with the, with the, uh, with the Mars 500 mission, that this has got a, a measurable you know, negative impact on, on crew behavior, on crew performance. The Soviet stroke Russians have known this for many, many years because they pioneered long duration space flight through the Salyut series of space stations and then Mir and now the ISS. The Americans had a real shock when they started doing joint missions with Mir in the 1990s. They did two week shuttle missions, thought astronauts can do anything. Then they realized, no, you can't. You need to look at the psychological and, and the crew factors. ESA, the European Space Agency, are now very, very focused in this area. NASA, I think it's fair to say, took a long time to come on board. Um, and so it, is, it has got a greater and greater importance and significance. I've talked about operational issues for long duration spaceflight. Um, I think the other part of your question is about normalization of deviance. I, I think we, we are still in danger of falling into that trap and we've seen it. You know, I can think of, you could argue that the Comet jetliner in the 1950s, there was an element of normalization of deviance there with multiple failures which had been warned about with the pressurization. Um, we just need to be on our guard against it. Ultimately, though, you're always going to get that problem because your engineers and your, your, your physicists will tell you one thing. When that, when that message is orthogonal to what policymakers would desire of something, unless we communicate very, very effectively what the consequences of those messages are in very blunt terms, then we're always going to have that potential tension. And I don't have a, a, a ready solution for you to that. I'm sorry. Thank you very much, everyone.